Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate van vandaag 5 februari 2016. Dit is het bulletin van vrijdag. Omdat ik vandaag niet in de gelegenheid ben om een uitgebreide uitzending te maken, heb ik een paar korte items in het Nederlands en vervolgens twee interessante items in het Engels. Het eerste van die items gaat over het decoderen van Enigma tijdens de Tweede Wereldoorlog in, Bet- in Bletchley Park. Het tweede item gaat over Duga 3 in Tsjernobyl, de locatie in Oekraïne waar in de jaren 80 de signalen van de Russische woedpekker vandaan kwamen. Vandaag is er voor één keer geen morsen en ook geen data in de uitzending. Op 2 april vindt in Eindhoven de VHF en Hogere Dag plaats. Je kunt je sinds vandaag hiervoor aanmelden via de aanmeldingspagina op www.vhf-hoger.nl Nee, punt .veron.nl Dus www.vhf-hoger.nl En dan rechtsklikken bij evenementen. Vanavond zendt de PI4AA weer uit volgens P1 PIP op hamnieuws.nl. Zijn de onderwerpen vanavond kort nieuws, DX nieuws, de eter en hoe komen we er eigenlijk aan? Solderen zonder soldeerbout en de tijd Tera MD380 is gehackt. Vanaf 2100 uur lokale tijd dus. De frequenties zijn zoals altijd 7073, 145325 en 4325 via PI2 NOS. Na afloop van de uitzending is er op 40 meter, als de condities tenminste niet tegenwerken, en op 70 centimeter een inmeldronde. Ten slotte is er vandaag de lange uitzending van PNL 0 Nieuws vanaf half 11 op de repeater PI3 UTR. The German Secret Service units issued a codebook which contained the settings for each day, which changed at midnight. All Enigma operators within a local network had to set their machines to the code setting for the day so that each of them could encode and decode letters and messages. Firstly, the operators chose three rotors from a box of five. These rotors were all wired differently and before placing them in the machine, the operators reset an inner wheel on the rotor to a marked position on the outer ring. They were then placed in the machine in the order indicated in the code book. Next the rotors are set to the letters of the day. The next part of the procedure is the stecker board which is indicated in the front of the machine. These steckers which are plugs are changed according to the code book again and each plug will change one letter for example the letter A to the letter K. When the operator presses let's say the letter A it sets up an electric current which runs through the machine first through the stecker board changing the letter each time it goes then runs to the rear of the machine first through the three rotors hits a reflector plate and comes back on a different part of the three rotors again finally lighting a lamp at the rear of the machine indicating another letter other than the one which was pressed the Enigma machine cannot encode the letter that you press in the first instance the remarkable thing about Enigma is that when you press a letter on the keyboard and the subsequent enciphered letter lights up to the rear of the machine the chances of that letter lighting up are nearly 158 million 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 to one now to put that into perspective your chances of winning the British National Lottery are approximately 18 million to one. It's a misconception that if you have a Enigma machine you can break any Enigma messages. This of course is completely untrue. It's necessary to break the key setting for the day before you can understand an Enigma message. In the 1970s, during the Cold War, if you wanted to see whether someone was launching an intercontinental ballistic missile at your country, you had two options. Put a satellite in space, which at that point was expensive, impractical and likely to fail, or build a radar system. But radar can only see to the horizon. It'll show you the, it'll show your missile in flight, but by the time you've seen it, your chain of command might not have time to react. You need to know it's launched when it's launched. 
you need radar powerful enough to bounce off the ionosphere, spread out for thousands of miles, and still have enough signal to be detectable after it bounces back. You need megawatts of power and one of the biggest radar arrays ever constructed. You need something like this. Welcome to the Duga 3 array in Chernobyl. This was known in the West as the Russian woodpecker. For more than a decade, it randomly hopped shortwave frequencies, trying to find the best one to get a return signal, sending out a repetitive that sounded like a woodpecker. It was so powerful that countries around the world filed official complaints with the Soviet Union, and there was a small industry of woodpecker filters, or Moscow mufflers, that would notch it out on your radio. There's another one about 60 kilometres away, they act as a pair, one transmits, one receives. And they need to be this big to get any sort of resolution. Uh, so you can tell roughly, very roughly, where the missile is headed. But the really clever thing is how any radar system like this can tell the difference between a missile and the ground. Because this isn't like pointing a radar into the air. If you're bouncing the signal, then the ground is going to reflect back just as much as the missile that is flying above it. How do you tell the difference? Doppler effect. The same way that the siren on a police car moving towards you sounds higher, the radar reflections from a missile will be at a higher frequency. And missiles move at speeds measures in miles per second. So Duggar didn't listen for the same frequency that it transmitted. It listened for a slightly higher one. If it found that return frequency, well, it didn't happen, fortunately. All that transmission power, all that disruption, was for nothing, wonderfully, because no one ever launched. And somehow, despite everything, humanity got through the Cold War. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks om 1900 uur te beluisteren op PI2 NOS. En ochtends om half elf verder zijn de uitzendingen onder andere te beluisteren op youtube.com schuine-pa0ete.